You know, oh, it's the start of something, hopefully. Welcome along to the Garibaldi Gazette. I'm coming to you live from Ireland, Cork specifically. So hello to all of our Irish fans. Uh, no Matt Davis Adams this week. So you're going to be here with me, Asha Ali. And uh, later I'm going to be joined by the athletic Nick Miller. Sorry, Nick Miller of the athletic. And uh, seeing as it's been a pretty deathly international break and, and save for the news of Forrest's lodging an appeal right at the deadline for you know what uh, and news this morning coming out that Forrest might be shopping for for managers again it's been pretty quiet hasn't it as a as a Reds fan so uh we thought we'd do something a little bit different this week which means we're going to be joined by a very special guest tall grumpy magnetic those are just some of the words used to describe his work. But today we're going to be meeting the man behind the art. And if there was an errant letter F flying around, we could be meeting the man behind the fart. But here at the Garibaldi Gazette Towers, we're only interested in one F. And that's the one F in Forest. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce an interview with artist and more importantly, Reds fan, David Shrigley. Enjoy. Welcome, David Shrigley. Hello, David. Hello. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so, you, David, you were... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm reading from, um, not less a source than Wikipedia here, um, but you were born in Cheshire, moved to Leicester when you were young, lived in Scotland for a lot of your life, and now I believe live in Brighton. So uh, can you uh, tell us how you became a Forest fan? I became a Forest fan in about early early 1978 um the story that i recall at that time was that my friend gareth i didn't really like football i was into star wars my friend gareth was into football and he told me that nottingham forest was was a really cool football team to support so i supported them as well and i thought yeah forest that's a good name for a team unlike city or united or whatever um so anyway that i was at that time about nine years old i think and um i support forest from then on and then um they won the league they won the league cup they won the european cup do i need to continue um, <laughs> they got relegated to league one um they got a points deduction and here we are the, the potted history of nottingham forest um, yeah, so I, I didn't understand the uh, implications of the decision I was making when I was about nine years old, because I lived in the su suburbs of Leicester at that time. And um, yeah, my life was made a misery kind of growing up by Leicester fans. And um, I didn't, I, I had to um be very covert about my love of Nottingham Forest didn't I didn't go to Forest that much until I got a bit older like my 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 dad bless him who didn't like football took me periodically and um and then my sister moved to Nottingham to study my older sister so I'd go and stay with her and her and her boyfriend would take me to see Forest and eventually I started going on my own and um basically my my following of Nottingham Forest has always been a very lonely pursuit until fairly recently. Uh, there was a moment in the early noughties where I made a couple of friends who I went with and they sort of, they lived in London, friends of friends. So I went with them for a few years and then they kind of moved away, lost touch. And it's only really recently, like probably 2019, that I've actually made a group of friends who I go with. So 
been going to watch Boris for 40 odd years alone, or occasionally with my dad, occasionally with my sister. Um, but yeah, mostly alone, traveling to, you know, Walsall on a Tuesday night, alone, uh, watching Forest. And also it was not helped by the fact I moved to Glasgow when I was 19. So that's a tricky, uh, it's tricky to get to the city ground on a Saturday afternoon and back. Um, I used to time visits to my parents, obviously, with home games, still do. Um, we still live in Leicester. And uh, yeah, so I have quite a different experience of supporting Forest. Like, I was really excited when we were in League One because we played Carlisle away. And I could, that's the one game that I could do in a day quite easily, <laughs> only an hour and a half drive from Glasgow. <laughs> and um, Newcastle away was a bit tricky, but I was, did that. Sunderland away, did that. Um, so yeah, been to probably as many away games as I have home games because even now I live in Brighton it's quite a tough Saturday to get up at half past you know to be on the train at half past eight in the morning and then back home about 10 o'clock at night um full of beer and misery um but you know I all we we all do it to ourselves don't we and um Forest is the really the only thing that really makes me happy and really makes me miserable. Apart, you know, <laughs> apart from the you know the normal things in life like love and despair and stuff. But uh, I also I also started watching Partick Thistle when I lived in Glasgow, and I kind of there was never any conflict of interest there, so I could go and watch Thistle of a weekend. They're sort of the non-partisan team in Glasgow, and and that gave me a lot of joy and I sort of became involved with the club and got met a rich hedge fund manager and he ended up sponsoring the club. Um, these things happen. I designed the mascot, became very famous, still have a lot to do with Partick Thistle, still have a, an emotional investment with Partick Thistle, but it sort of oscillates sometimes. I started going to watch Thistle because it took my mind off Forest. <laughs> Saturday afternoon, when you're watching remotely, or following the games remotely, it's just miserable. I find it truly miserable. When you're at the game, it's all right. But if you're just following from afar, as I, I was a lot of the time, it just makes you so upset. So to take my mind off it, I started to go and watch Partick Thistle. And um, and uh, and then I, you know, after a certain point, there were certain seasons where, you know, Forest weren't going to go up and weren't going to go down. And then Thistle's fortunes were a bit more exciting they could go up or they could go down so um so that changed a bit and I, I I still go and watch different football teams I have a my wife has a house in Devon so I go and watch Exeter City fairly often and I go and watch a non-league team here called Whitehawk but again in some ways it's uh, it's really just to take my mind off Forest and um Exeter City actually got promoted a couple of seasons ago from League Two to League One and there was, a, there was a terrible moment, actually, where I thought that they were going to end up playing Forest, which would have been terrible. Um, but the, the night Exeter got promoted, I was there. It was a midweek game. We were playing Fulham. It was when we beat Fulham 1-0 away, which was sort of April, I think. And everybody was on the pitch, except for the disabled people and me. And I was in the stands looking at my phone because the phone <laughs> finished yet. And I said to myself, and they were like, "Where?" They were like, "Where are you?" I was, I was like, I, "Forest game, I haven't finished yet." All oh, right, yeah. And um, I realised I just need to get to, I just need to go to the games. That it's, it's a distraction from watching another game in some ways. So um, now I've got some friends to go with. I go and watch them. Uh, well, not more than I used to, but I I watch Forest. It's a bit more of a a, a bit of a, a less lonely pursuit these days. Um, I, I so find I don't know about you, but like watching lower league football now, the, with the state the Forest are and where they are now, it feels like a kind of colonic, <laughs> like a bit of a sort of palate cleanse. I know those are two opposite ends of the body, but do you know what I mean? It feels like. From what, seeing, you're, <laughs> from what you're seeing on TV and you're seeing this kind of 
shiny glossy product and just the excess of it all i don't know like with whitehawk though that's a you know those kind of teams they've got a little bit more about them so like my local team is york city so i go and see them and, and you know they're sort of perfectly miserable they're kind of you know not really doing up to much but they don't really stand for anything whereas whitehawk i know obviously are famous for being sort of you know the the clash come alive you know if they were a football team they're sort of anti-racist anti-fascist you know all that kind of stuff so does that does it feel like that when you go and watch the team like whitehawk it does unless forest are playing at the same time in which case it's just a horrible distraction <laughs> you know i'm not i, I what i love what i love about the premier league um palette cleansing etc aside is that they don't play always at three o'clock on a Saturday. So it doesn't actually ruin my experience of watching Whitehawk. Because, you know, often it's uh, go to Whitehawk and then, I'm, you know, I've taken the dog and stuff. And um, and then we lose 4-0 to West Ham. And it's sort of like, oh, yeah, it's just really, they're like, why are you so miserable? We're winning. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to talk about it um so yeah i don't know but yes you're right there is something really lovely about um about white hawk because the, the club is really progressive the fan base is really progressive and um it's kind of funky it's very bright you know in both a good way and a bad way you know so people sort of dress like they're going to a fancy dress party which is what brighton is like you know if you're familiar with brighton um but yeah, there's something really nice about a community club and knowing the players and, um, you know, coiling on a horrible pitch. And you can take the dog and take the kids. You can, um, you can drink beer if you drink beer while you watch. Um, and you actually feel that you have some ownership of the experience. Whereas, yeah, Premier League is just a product where we're just, you know, we can be treated it's the yeah i mean it's an amazing product you know to be peddling because you can have completely abuse the customer you can make the customer miserable you can give them a horrible match day experience you can rip them off as you wish and they will still keep coming back <laughs> and i can't think of another product that you or service that you can sell where the customer will do that i don't know it's like sort of S and M or something, you know. Yes, drugs. Yeah, yeah. drugs. Yeah. I mean, drugs are more fun than the Premier League. To be honest. So, yeah, are we are we saying that if Forest got relegated down to kind of non-league regional leagues, then we'd all actually be a lot happier about things? That's obviously not what I'm saying. <laughs> um, it's an observation. Uh, yeah, I should also say I was on the Scottish Football Podcast last week. So I, having bored myself talking about art for the last many years, I'm suddenly, yeah, my cup runneth over. You know, I'm suddenly talking about something that I actually <laughs> have a, well, a, more than a professional um, involvement in, I suppose. So, yeah. So weirdly, I was talking about Partick Thistle last week and Kingsley, the mascot. And, you know, and, and rather different, you know, um, I always associate Scottish football with freezing to death, you know, because <laughs> it's if you think that Nottinghamshire is cold, west of Scotland, you know, going up to an away game at Dingwall um, in January, that's harsh, man. That's harsh. Anyway, you know, we love it. We do it. Um, you mentioned um, Kingsley. I'm sure you asked about kingsley uh, a, a huge amount um yeah have you ever i mean ever had any designs to sort of jazz up forest's mascot at all i don't know actually what is the forest mascot at the moment is it the is it sure it's not sure it's still sure with the bear is yes it? the one with the you know the boss's name robin robin hood type character oh uh, yeah, yeah that, that guy back it's a bit like rubbish, it. isn't it yeah I with a like square that. jaw yeah, yeah. I, I like nutty the squirrel he was good <laughs> i mean the squirrel really made sense to me but then it was a fox, and I'm like, come on, you're kind of a fox. <laughs> Someone what? dropped the ball there. Share with, it was share with the fox. I'm like, whose idea was that? I mean, yeah, I obviously I know a lot about my Scots, and I would do I would kind of do pretty much anything for Forest because because I love Forest, obviously, but also 
the thing about Partick Thistle and Whitehawk is that I've kind of been done stuff for the club and I've become, you know, so if ever I want tickets for, if ever Thistle got to the final of a playoff, for example, you know, I get offered a ticket. I got offered a ticket for Thistle in the playoff final last year. You may know that they, anyway, if you don't know what happened, it was, it was um, hilariously awful. But trying to get, I, you know, trying to get tickets for this playoff, because I, I, I like, probably like a lot of Forest fans, my membership lapsed during COVID. I was like, well, what's the point of getting a membership? And then I just couldn't get it back. And it's been really difficult to get tickets. And then the mother of all games happened where we went to Wembley and we were, I, can't remember, I was going to pay like £2,000 for a ticket for that game until Rob Fish, bless him, came up with a friend from the FA and we got tickets. But if that had been Partick Pistol, I'd have been right in there. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I feel like I, I feel like I want to ingratiate myself to the club just so that when the time comes, I can get tickets for those special games. I'm sure there will be more. We'll... <laughs> I, I only managed to get a ticket for the player funnel because someone else just decided not to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, oh. I know. I mean, we could do, do a whole podcast on that. Um, yeah. On the, the, the kind of dark soul that, that made that active decision. Yeah, that person's um, been huddled in regret ever since. Well, I hope so. Find out, but I, yeah, I also like one of my. We, I ended up getting two tickets and took a very fair weather forest fan with me, sitting next to me, um, who wasn't emotionally invested in the result as I was. And he, so I was saw him last weekend, and he was like, "Oh, you remember that game? You were just sitting there rocking, and <laughs> your eyes closed for the entire game, just like saying the same thing over and over." Like keep the ball, keep the ball, keep the ball, and um, basically everybody in this, all all Forest fans were like that. Sort of, it was just a moment of intense anxiety, and yeah, and then yep. followed by uh, followed by joy, followed by an entire season of anxiety, <laughs> followed by joy, followed by a season of worse anxiety, which is where <laughs> we're at. Forest. I... Yeah, the, the, I think I, I, just before the playoff final, I'd go, I was with my wife and she'd, I'd gone very quiet and she said, are, are you all right? This was the day of the game. And I said, no, obviously not. Was, why would I be all right? Just, just horrific. I've blacked out sort of all of it. I just remember arriving at my seat and then something happened. Um, and then I, I've, I've uh, decided to forego a halftime snack. I remember that bit, <laughs> and then uh, dancing, lots of lots of dancing and hugging random people. Yeah, there was that. I remember the joy was so overwhelming that people just didn't know what to do with themselves. But like I didn't, and my friend Rob Fish, who got the tickets for me, we were in a pub. I don't know somewhere in North London, and um, just sort of trying to process what had happened, and it. No, there were no forest fans there. There were just us, and it, they were doing like some kind of quiz. There was like a pub quiz, and um, and he just in between questions he ran up and got the mic and then made a made what I recall to be a fifteen minute speech about not <laughs> <laughs> this group of people in the pub who would thought they were doing a pub quiz, and there was this dude from Nottingham just giving them a blow by blow account of what had happened and what it meant and and then they all gave him a round of applause oh yeah yeah that's excellent spreading the brief moment of joy of nottingham forest to strangers in the north on the pub yeah wonderful yeah. <laughs> um yeah there's there's a lot to be said for the I, 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 we've we've talked about this before i think i might have mentioned it on the the episode that we put out with nadia whitton I was just too exhausted after the game to to celebrate at all. I just was in I was in bed by about half nine. It was just a, a, a as you say an, a, an emotionally overwhelming um, experience that I don't I don't know whether it, we, we've all we, any of us have really kind of gone over it. Really, it's yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, there was the Arsenal, the Arsenal game last season when we beat mm-hmm. one 0 That was pretty 
that felt good that felt really good um, but it wasn't quite it wasn't quite as like we i felt like i was better able to deal with that joy but the joy of actually winning the playoff final i didn't really know what to do about that it was like being a small child <laughs> yes i guess that probably says more about us as forest fans we always sort of i don't know about you guys but we always i always sort of go in armed for the worst always you know not in that kind of like you know lack of optimism but just kind of i don't know it's just kind of yeah it's kind of self defense isn't it you know we've been disappointed so many times especially in moments like that of high drama of high kind of jeopardy that you just yeah. think oh they'll they'll forest it they'll find a forest way and uh, we'll we'll balls it up yeah uh yeah i don't know i mean i am um, there is that kind of inverse um superstition where if you tell yourself it's going to be terrible then it will be okay um i think the worst season of anxiety for me was kind of the covid season because it was all kind of remote and also we were doing really badly as well and might have got relegated um but for glenn murray <laughs> and, uh, and then i found that torturous I found that all those COVID games really, really torturous. Like I was really, truly miserable. And I think it probably was because you couldn't actually go to the game because there's something very healing about being at the game with 30,000 other anxious, angry, unhappy, but sometimes joyful people. But yeah, was, COVID was hard. It was like in a sort of extent, you know, the thing that sports people always say about how they're always more nervous if they're... If they're part of a team and they're watching the game, they're always more nervous when they're watching them if they are actually taking part. And it's a sort of, obviously we can't, we, I think we sort of kid ourselves that we can affect the, the play and affect how Forest do, which I suppose we can to a point. But it's just, I think it was a sort of extension of that is that you, 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 you we, we still, still do, do have this sort of semi-true fantasy that um, we can do something about it if, if we're actually there. But uh, yeah, as you say, because we weren't, we couldn't do anything about it. We were just sort of staring at small screens or, you know, relying on Radio Nottingham or whatever. And yeah. it was uh, just a bleak, bleak experience. Yeah, bleak, bleak experience. I mean, you. I feel like you can influence the game if you're there by shouting, Eat the ball! Would I swear on this? Hmm? Eat the... Keep the bloody ball. <laughs> Shout that at the top of your voice throughout the game. That's going to help the side, I reckon. Or shouting man on. <laughs> man on. Some sort of, it all, we always do that with the best of intentions, but because it all comes out at the wrong time, it just goes, Nuh! and it doesn't help anyone. Like if there was a clear unified shout of man on, you know, mm. the, the guy would know. Yeah. But there's, you know, a football is sort of, it always seems to be like a split between the real negative people who are there for some kind of shout therapy and don't really understand that shouting just the, give it up there you twat shouting that isn't really helpful um, um you know, whereas singing miss rolling in front of trent is kind of helpful in unison um but i don't know i mean i, I guess people who shout give it up there you twat uh, you know, that is um, a symptom of the uh, emotional state that they're in and there's nothing they can do about it. It's involuntary. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I just suddenly feel nervous. I'm going to Palace on Saturday. I feel a bit sick now, actually, thinking about it. But the, the thing is, though, that we, we're not going to talk about current events, obviously, as we've as stated. However... Um, I I actually feel we're doing all right this season, and what? But I, you know, this is secret. I'm not telling anybody else this. I'm just telling you this. I think we're doing all right because we're playing better than we were last season, and it seemed like we just managed to pull results out of our asses last season somehow. And I feel like we're actually just sort of squandering the same results, having played really well. But I just feel a sense of dread. <laughs> <laughs> 
what what a <laughs> what a sentence that was to start off with. Yeah, we were actually playing all right, but uh, yeah. The, the... I tell you what really annoys me this season is pe- you, before the game you're talking to people and they say, "Do you know what? I think we'll be all right this season." And I say, "Don't say that. That's, <laughs> we're not going to be all right. <laughs> it's going to be terrible." We're playing Exeter City. We won't play Derby next season. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> but I tell you what is good if we <laughs> the inevitable does happen. We'll have a really good championship side, and we get all the players back on loan. The entire <laughs> squad that we've got on loan. That's Josh quite a bowler. Let's see, yeah, Josh quite, quite, a, quite a decent squad for the championship. I reckon. Yeah. Bring Worrell back. Got Yates in there, I think. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a good start. Yeah. Bring, bring, bring Jed. Bring, bring Jed back. It'll be all right. Yeah. Bring Jed, Jed Spence back as well. Get the old band back together. Brilliant. Band yeah. back together. Oh, Jed. Why yeah. do you have to mention Jed? Yeah. But sorry. That Korean guy's quite good if he was given a chance in the championship, whatever his name is. Huang Yu Zhou. Huang. Yeah. Huang. Um, we've, uh, we've obviously discussed. The existential despair of um, uh, of supporting Nottingham Forest has uh, has the existential despair of supporting Nottingham Forest. Do you think influenced your work at any point? I'm talking to David here. I mean, it could it could be for Archer <laughs> well, well, for well, oh, well, actually, yeah. it'd be very unprofessional of Ar- if it affected Arch- Arsh's work, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, Arsh- but, but, but saying that though, without way you smiling. But saying that though, I like sorry to just come in and hear, but like there was a time when I would turn down work because it would interfere with forest fixtures, and I knew that there was no way I'd be able to get back, or like, oh, it, it'd be filming in Latvia or something, and I'd be like, I'm not doing that. I'm not. I'm going to miss <laughs> Forest. How awful is that? You miss <laughs> Preston away. Yeah, I'm going to miss Stoke at home. What are you talking about, mate? Tell Martin Scorsese. We've got a League Cup game that week. <laughs> if he wants me, he can array, rearrange filming around the championship fixture list. Yeah, yeah. bring Forrest uh, to America. Play the play the fixture out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I do that obviously, but I can I can do that, you know, because it's not um, my presence generally isn't required on particular days. Things can be be rearranged. Um, but yeah, that angst finds its way into my work. I, I used to feel like football was kind of a release um, from art, you know. Art, I mean, obviously, I love being an artist. That I'm the luckiest man in the world that I just get to do silly drawings all day and, and not have to have a job. And also indulge my, uh, my football um, penchants as well. But um, yeah, that also football is um is the most exquisite torture and you have to uh sometimes as a, on a therapeutic level you have to do drawings about um angst and violence in order to soothe yourself when you've drawn against Luton twice that requires some work some personal work as yeah as I said to Asha before this podcast those games those two games they're like that's like having like being stabbed in the heart as two equalizers late equalizers they're, they're as painful as as the the most some of the most painful goals i've seen um just i don't think i'll ever get over it the only way i'm going to get over that is if we stay up obviously and then I'll, you know i'll do some really happy drawings of <laughs> like um, Bambi or something, you know. <laughs> As a, do, can can you ever? I mean, even like look at a, a piece of work that you've done and then and then think, oh yeah, I remember that game, the game that. You know. <laughs> yeah, I can. I can actually. Yeah. <laughs> I can. I mean, some you know, it works both ways. Where you're just like, right, I'm not going to think about football ever again. I'm just going to you know focus on art from now on until next Saturday at least. But yeah, definitely. I mean, often I, um, you know, I go to the studio on a Saturday afternoon if if there's no football to go to and I'll just make art just, you know, because art's a therapy, right? Art's really important for everybody, not just for professional artists. It's a good thing to do. It's good for your emotional health. It's good for 
everything it's a positive thing so if you do that rather than just sitting in front of a laptop screen looking at twitter x kind of <laughs> swearing and rocking and chanting um that's positive right so yeah that um art is life football is misery occasionally football is joy if i mean you've uh being a football journalist i do spend a huge amount of my time staring bleakly at twitter slash x so i i think what the, the lesson we've got from this is that i need to take up drawing of some description you should everybody should um yeah art health and well-being that's my thing you know football health and well-being i don't know how that <laughs> being when i'm playing football that's good that's healthy everybody yeah. yeah let's get running around but just watching it Oof. don't go there what one of the things i occasionally meet people and I say, oh, what team do you support? And I say, oh, I don't really support a team. I'm not, you know, occasionally, you know, I go and watch Arsenal now and again, or I watch Orient or whatever. I think, wow, that must be nice. You know, just not to, just to go to games and just enjoy the smell of the pies and the, the banter um, and not be emotionally invested into it. But I don't know, maybe that's a mistake. Maybe that's like, you know, never getting into a relationship because you're afraid of getting hurt. And it's not going to, you're never going to experience joy. You're never going to experience the joy of um, beating Bristol City away on a Tuesday night with two injury time goals. Uh, yeah, and, scored by someone with pink hair who's yeah. also yeah. a Tory. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Is it well? Yeah, wow, my detail. <laughs> Great. The, the, I, I was uh, supposed to be working in an impartial capacity at that game, um, reporting on it. It was the the greatest test of my professionalism uh, of all time. I think I don't. I, I don't think I, I can't really remember disgracing myself. Like Gary, must be like Gary Neville. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nancy didn't deserve to win. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why would you have to talk about those days? The Stevie Cooper days. Oh. Stevie Cooper. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know it hurt. It hurt. But I sort of, yeah. we were we were really okay with it. Like four games <laughs> later, weren't we? That's, um, it's a, it's it is another frequent topic of, of conversation on this podcast that we tend to. We did, I think we've probably asked everyone who who's uh, been on about how your it's how long how far removed are we now four months or three four months from cooper going how are you i don't think me asher and matt have really dealt still dealing with it emotionally very well what what was how are you feeling about steve cooper no longer being forest manager um there's no place for sentiment in football <laughs> as you well know um, but yeah, Steve, Steve Cooper, I, I guess, you know, he's just a lovely man and like, I loved him. I still love him. I still wish him well, even if he goes to Derby or somewhere, I still have a soft spot for him. Um, I think, you know, and also the thing is, if we had like six more points at this point, or, or maybe 10 more points, we'd all be just like, yeah, we love Steve Cooper. But anyway, you know, he's our guy, blah, blah, blah. But um I think the thing about Steve Cooper, the thing I think now is that there was a certain magic. There was a certain magic that he had where he could sort of somehow just get us over the line in certain games. But then, you know, we were we didn't there were lots of games last season where we didn't even lay a glove on anybody and got nothing and deserved nothing. Hardly had a shot on goal. And Steve Cooper some, somehow out seemed to magic those results which we sort of didn't really reserve, deserve like that, you know the early game against West Ham at home game against Palace bloody lucky in those games and that was sort of Steve Cooper magic and it was sort of a special positive magic because he deserves it because he's a lovely lovely man and um and we all love him and that's but I feel like you know now that kind of Nuno is sort of a, a jaded, you know, journeyman coach, and somehow he he that magic is 
he's deprived of that magic, that bit of luck somehow. But um, yes. yeah, he just he just doesn't quite often just doesn't. It, he looks like he would rather be anywhere else, which doesn't you know, a he doesn't give you a huge amount of confidence that he's going to inspire the team, but also it makes him quite difficult to warm to. Not a not a very warmy to character. Yeah, but the thing is, if you win, <laughs> thing, this is true. The goals start winning. Um, suddenly, you start smiling. Whereas right now, he's just sort of grimacing, like his sort of not quite clenched teeth, but just sort of, you know, he's like a sort of, yeah, he's like a sort of monk who's you know discovering that God might not exist. Yeah. <laughs> It feels like that. It feels like there's definitely like, what have I done with my life? This is what I've committed to, and and why? Well, like he's like he's watching, finding out that one of his children is like um, has some behavioural disorder, and he's watching them play, <laughs> and and it's just a he's trying not to just start shaking his head, <laughs> <laughs> and sort of like. You know, he's just sort of looking at things and thinking, why is this unfolding in this way when I've prepared so well? Why can we still not defend a set piece? You know, why? I'm so good at this. Why is it not working? This is this is one of the, I mean, one of the very, very many reasons why I'd be a terrible football manager because I would just be standing on the sideline doing that. And I, I'd just be... Thinking, but I told them to. I told them to score goals, and I told them not to concede any goals, and they're doing the exact opposite of that. So what's 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 going on here? Is that your halftime team talk? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I, remember what I told you before the game? Exactly. Done yeah. that? No. Well, I'll do it in the second half then. Um, I don't know. I would suppose you always think there's these legendary managers who don't say anything at halftime. They just give them a stern look, and uh, and that works amazingly well. I mean, that's obviously a lot of bollocks. Um, because it's all about, you know, I don't know, tactics and stuff that, um, I mean, Nuno knows a lot about tactics and I know very little. He probably knows about man management and stuff. The only thing I can do really is just magical thinking. And that's <laughs> what I, that's, that would be my approach because that's really all that's available to me, magical thinking. I would, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I would go, what I would do is I'd have a little jar of turmeric and I'd sprinkle a little bit to the defender. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's the classic thing of, nice. um, uh, as someone who's been involved in a, a lot of um, how event X happened in, you know, football, is the sort of, it's obviously the sort of thing that if Forrest won, then then everyone would be sprinkling turmeric around and it'd be the great, the great uh, spice genius David Shrigley has um, sprinkled this on on football, but then if it failed, you would be lunatic David Shrigley who you tried to uh, who eschewed tactical talk and man management in in favour of turmeric. Oh yeah, there'd be other things as well, man. I just like paint a bit of glitter onto <laughs> Anthony Elanga's boots so that 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 goal would have gone in. I'd do, yeah. you know. I'd, rub some mandrake into um onto um the center back's head um stuff like that Put some must try sangare's boots yeah just to get him moving but yeah he's been a little bit sluggish recently um but he's going to come good he's going to come good that's because of as soon as <laughs> the turmeric kicks in <laughs> So no pun intended. He is gonna he's gonna be the player that we paid for. Yes. Um well with with all the with all the, your um inspirational tactics and the turmeric in mind, can you reassure us, David, what's gonna are we gonna be all right? Is this how's the rest of the season gonna gonna pan out? Do you know what, Nick? I think we're going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be fine. Yeah, we're going to be fine. Uh, come on. Come on, lads. Optimism. Come on. You don't get out for now in these days. And what can we do? Let's face it. What can we do? There is nothing that we can do. We can jibber jabber this nonsense at each other. Or we can be positive and we can sprinkle turmeric on players 
when we see them in Asda. I'm going to take some on Saturday. If anyone yeah. lives near me. Yeah, if you see some of that. Right, if you see Ryan Yates in Asda, you can just be like, just drop some turmeric into his basket. And or no, buy the turmeric and then after he's gone through the checkout, just say, Oh, I noticed you didn't buy any turmeric. Ryan, this is for you. It's kind of for you, Ryan Yates. Yeah. Just use his full name. You've got to use his full name. <laughs> Bless him with the turmeric as he's standing uh, something outside the supermarket. I don't know why I said turmeric, but it's um but it's a good thing, right? Turmeric and yeah, positivity and yeah. turmeric. And, and it helps in recovery and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah man. And um it leaves what, a stain, it leaves a mark. What else? what else? What can we what else can we realistically do? But then at the same time, as we've discussed, pessimism is a form of optimism as well. And sometimes there's that reverse um reverse superstitious thing where it'd be like, we're fucked. You know, so I'll say that as well. We're going down. We're gonna. We're going down with the Tories. We're going down. Well, uh, as uh, as a, I think as an institution, it's uh, after hosting Rishi Sunak uh, last week. It's no, it's no more than we deserve. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably a, a suitably downbeat note to to end things on. So, David Shrigley, thank you very much for joining us. My great pleasure.